Thank you for joining our church online. We encourage you to visit citylightla.church for our service times, location, and upcoming events. If you enjoy our videos and would like to give to lives being changed in Los Angeles, visit citylightla.church slash give. Open your Bibles to John chapter number 14 this morning, and uh, we're going to continue in our study uh, through the gospel of John in this new year, and we're looking forward to all that we're going to continue to learn from it uh, here in the writings of John. Today we're in John chapter 14, and I appreciate Pastor Alberto doing an incredible job last week teaching us the beginning part of John chapter 14. Today we're going to be focusing in on a few small verses, but they carried carry such a weight to them. John 14 in verse 21 to verse 24. I believe these verses can be misunderstood by some, can be wrongly teached by some, but I want to focus today on knowing Christ more intimately. I think it's so appropriate for a new year, and I love as we chose to go through John's writings months back, how we land here on this passage that I believe sets us up for one of the best years ever, uh, one of the years where we can see Jesus do a greater work in our lives and in our families than ever before. And I think what we need more than any other type of resolution is this heart's cry to know Christ more intimately. This heart's cry to go deeper with Jesus. This heart's cry to say, Jesus, I don't want to just settle. I want more. I want to go deeper. I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to understand. I want to go forward. And in John 14, we're going to look at verse 21 to verse 24 together this morning. He who has my commandments and keeps them, is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will reveal myself to him. Then Judas Iscariot said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us but not the world? Jesus answered him, If a man loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him. And make our home with him. And he who does not love me does not keep my words. The word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. How do we know Christ more intimately in this new year? I think one of the most profound theological books, Lucy says to Charlie Brown, and I got it for you on the screen. Life is a mystery, Charlie Brown. Do you know the answer? Charlie lifts his finger and uh, pontificates. Be kind, don't smoke, be prompt, smile a lot, eat sensibly, avoid cavities, and mark your ballot carefully. <laughs> avoid too much sun, send overseas packages early, love all creatures above and below, ensure your belongings, and try to keep the ball low. Now, none of us may like simplistic answers to deep questions. I read that because it's a very simplistic answer, and, and I think for us, oftentimes we ask these deep questions and we get a simplistic answer back. And sometimes we're looking for this deep theological answer that's going to answer our deep theological question and we don't always get it. And I think for us, one of the deepest questions we can ask, and I think that is asked in Christian circle, and I think this will resonate with everyone in this room, is this question on the screen. How can I experience a deeper, closer more intimate relationship with Christ. I would bet that everyone in this room at one time in your life have asked that question. I pray that you have. How can I experience a deeper, more intimate relationship with Christ? All through, although all Christians believe certain core doctrines, we all believe certain core doctrines, Christianity is not merely intellectually believing doctrines. And although all Christians hold to some common moral standards, Christianity is not primarily following a moral code. Rather, at the heart of what it means to be a Christian, what does it mean to be a Christ follower? It is to enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ through faith in his atoning death and resurrection. When you put faith in Jesus Christ, you become a Christian. You become a Jesus follower. And I think about the relationship you begin with Christ. Relationships are not static relationships grow. I think of those of us that are married, maybe you've been married five years or 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, that relationship never stops growing. Oftentimes I look at people that have been married for 50, 60 years and I look at the, 
the depth of their love and, and the, the, the deepness of their relationship they have. How did it arrive there? Because it kept growing after year, after year, after year. Relationships with our marriage, with our children, with friends keep on growing. They are not to be static. Same is with our relationship with Jesus Christ. It is to keep on growing. And so one of the most important Christ, uh, questions a Christian can ask is how can I know Christ more intimately? How can I know him more intimately? And honestly, the answer is pretty simple. Now, you may not like the answer, and you may balk at the answer, but how do we go deeper with Jesus? How do we understand him more and go deeper with him? Jesus gives us the answer, and he tells us to on, on the screen this morning. I have it typed out for you. We will grow to know Christ more intimately by obeying him. We will grow to know Christ more intimately by obeying him. Now, I know many times in the Christian community, we don't like that word obey. Right when we hear that word obey, we think legalism. <laughs> but as Jesus is teaching us here, the words of Jesus. Now, I, I believe the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation, but where Jesus speaks, I, I, I kind of put a little bit of my ear up a little higher, okay? And, and this is the words of Jesus. He's discipling, he's teaching his followers here. He's telling them, those that are his followers, how do you know me more? How do you go deeper with me? How do you get more intimate with me to obey him. If we have his commandments and keep them, he says both the Father and, the, and Jesus will love us. And Jesus promises that he will disclose himself to us. And further, both the Father and the Son will make their home with us. And the key to an ever-deepening relationship with Jesus Christ is to obey him. He's trying to teach his disciples this in his final moments with them. Before we look at this more in detail, let me make it clear that this instructions here are to those that already are in a relationship with Jesus by faith. These are for believers in Christ only. If you've not come to Christ, if you're in this room and you've never put faith in Jesus before and you've never trusted him to forgive your sins and to give you eternal life, this does not apply to you. You cannot get saved by keeping God's commandments. There's nothing you can do good enough to earn your way to heaven. No one can be perfect. No one can love God with all their heart, all their soul and mind and strength perfectly. Nobody can love their neighbor as himself perfectly. No one can. And so we understand, as Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so just to make sure there's no confusion, the, the context of this passage are the disciples of Jesus. The context of this passage is those that are in a relationship with Jesus Christ already. As Paul writes in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. We understand it's a gift of God, not of works, so that no one should boast. So faith, when we put faith in Jesus, faith in the gospel, it brings us in to a love relationship with Jesus who died for our sin. And obedience, obedience is the fruit that results in knowing him in a deeper way. Love or the gospel and obedience are not at odds with each other. If you think that the gospel and obedience are at odds with each other, then you don't truly understand the gospel. The gospel is free. The fruit of the gospel is obedience. Now, having the ability to be obedient, having the ability to overcome, having the ability to walk in the Spirit. And so Jesus is given these words about obedience to his disciples to comfort them, to encourage them on the night before he died on the cross. He literally is the day before he dies on the cross, and he's understanding they're about to go into a new year. They're about to go into a new season. They're about to go into some new opportunities they're about to see mega revivals. They're about to see mega church growth. They're about to see the spirit of God come down upon them. They're about to see God move among them. He knew there was a new day with them, and he knew that if they were going to be able to make it through the trials, to make it through the next chapter, they're going to have to go deeper in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And my prayer for us, church, in 2020 is that we'd go deeper, that we would go deeper in our relationship with Jesus. And I want to give you two main thoughts this morning and kind of unpack them together. One, 
Obedience is the evidence that we love Jesus Christ. Obedience is the evidence that we love Jesus Christ. I want to build a case for this because I know a lot of people balk at the word obedience. I realize that using the word obedience, I may be a call, accused of being a legalist. But may I point out to you that Jesus emphasized this word in verse 15, in verse 21, in verse 23, in verse 24. He'll hit it again in John 15. You can't run from it. Chapter verse 7, John 15, 10, John 15, 12, John 15, 14, John 15, 17. And Jesus was not a legalist. He was not being legalistic, but he focuses on this word obedience. To say, as I said already, that God's grace and our obedience are at odds is to misunderstand the gospel and to misunderstand God's grace. Notice what Titus chapter 2 says in verse 11 through 12. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly desires, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in godliness in this present world. In other words, God's grace instructs us to live obediently. God's grace instructs you, instructs me to live obediently for Jesus Christ. I just cited the, the beautiful promise in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 9 a second ago. Look at verse 10 of that same passage. For we are his workmanship after you get the gospel, after you are saved. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God's grace produces a life of good works. You say, how do you make sure obedience doesn't become legalistic? If you were raised in maybe a conservative church world, maybe you were exposed to a legalistic side of Christianity, maybe you were raised by legalistic parents, maybe you had a tendency to, to kind of go towards legalism and you've come out of it. Well, we understand how do we protect obedience from not becoming legalistic? It's a four-letter word, love. Love. Jesus Christ hammers on this in John 14, 15. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. In John 14, 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. John 14, 24. He who does not love me does not keep my words. Love for Christ motivates us to obey him. Now, maybe in your life before, or maybe raised in church, or maybe you had a season where you did things for God because you didn't want him to get on your, you didn't want to get on his naughty list, or you felt like, well, I didn't do this, you know, man, the wrath of God is going to come down upon me. So your motivation was guilt. Your motivation was maybe the, the guilt-driven style of preaching, the, 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 the pressure being put on you. Church, I'll tell you right now, our, 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 our push for obedience, our push to obey is love. That is what protects us from legalism. The love of Christ is pushing us towards obedience. And, and think about the biblical word love. It's not the Hallmark movie love, all right? Deepless in Seattle love. It is a little bit deeper love. The biblical meaning of love is not just warm and fuzzy. Biblical love is self-sacrificing. Biblical love is a self-sacrificing, caring commitment that seeks the highest good of the one loved. I'll say it again. Biblical love is a self-sacrificing, caring commitment that seeks the highest good of the one loved. If we love Christ, the highest good we seek for him is to glorify him. How did Jesus glorify the Father? He did this by obeying the Father. John 15, 10, John 17, 4. We glorify Christ. How do we glorify him? What does that mean to glorify him? We make him look good. We make him look good, right? Like some of us do on our uh, Instagram posts. I laugh. Sometimes we use that, that filter so strong. It's like, dude, it's just a fog over your face, right? We all know you don't look that way. How do we glorify Christ? How do we make him look good? We do that by obeying him. When we sin, we dishonor him. We make him look bad. If we love Christ, our aim should be to glorify him. And Jesus indicates that there are two parts to obeying him. There are two parts. So we're kind of building a case for obedience in part one, and, and we're going to close off with what are the results of obedience in a Christian's life. To obey Christ, letter A, 
com- to obey Christ's commandments, we first must have them. Let's talk about this for a moment. To obey Christ's commandments, we first must have them. In John 14, 21, he says this. He who has my commandments. Church, we can't obey what we do not know or understand. What does it mean to have Christ's commandments? Hold your Bible in the air real high. You got Christ's commandments right there, right? You got the word of God right there. That's what that means, okay? It's a real simple answer. He who has my commandments, to understand them, to know them. I I once read about a campus minister who told about a young college student whom he led to Christ. A short time later, he uh, found the college student, and the college student ran up to him, and, and, and the new, he was a new convert, and he was really excited, and he told, him, uh, the, he told the campus worker how God blessed him this last weekend. And, and, and the minister said, how did, God, how did God bless you? He said, man, he gave me a, a, a beautiful girlfriend, and we had an incredible time in bed. And he didn't know, he didn't understand the Bible, he just knew that Jesus is awesome and Jesus died for a sin and that, 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 that Jesus was the way of forgiveness. He did not fully understand the things of, of God yet. Church, you can't keep his commandments that you don't even know about. To have Christ's commandments, you need to be in God's word consistently. As you approach a new year, I hope that God's word is on the top priority list. I hope that time in God's word, I hope that uh, having a, 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 a longing to learn more about him and to learn more about the word of God and to study more of the word of God is a priority on that list. Read it over and over until it shapes your worldview. I don't know about you, but I was raised in church and I read the Bible a lot of times in my life, but my mind is prone to wander, man. My mind is prone to go away. And so the word of God is, is, is shaping our worldview. If your worldview is shaped by the world, if your worldview is shaped by maybe media, you will think that it's acceptable to have sexual relations outside of marriage. Society will say it's okay. Hey, it's it's okay to do that. As long as you love each other, as long as you have a love, it's okay. You'll think that maybe living together before marriage is is good to uh, kind of discover if you're compatible with each other. And hey, culture says it, media says it, society says it. We'll be tempted, as we've seen in the church culture, for hey, homosexuality. It's okay. It's okay. They're they're amazing people. They're kind. They're they're good. There's no way that they that God would be against who they choose to love. Uh, church, I'm just saying. <laughs> Every worldview we have must be shaped by the word of God. Every worldview, every perspective, every, uh, everything culture will throw, we say, no, God's word is shaping us, not the world, not the media, not culture, not society around us. You will think that cheating on exams, you'll think that trying to cover up, trying to cover up your tracks are normal. Lying is normal. Uh, fluffing up your resume, trying to get that promotion. Everyone does it. You got to do it to make it in LA. It's normal to lie. It's normal to cheat. It's normal to, 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 to do these things. But when you begin to read God's word, when you begin to read God's word, you will discover that much of what you thought was right is actually wrong. And much of what you thought is wrong is actually right. Isaiah writes about this in Isaiah 5, verse 20 to 21. He says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who exchange darkness for light, and light for darkness, who exchange bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight. Church, one of the best ways to experience victory is to get the word of God in you. How do we live obediently? How do we live obediently? To obey Christ, we first must know him. We get into the word. As Psalms 119, verse 11, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. You will seldom have a Bible and concordance in your hand when you're looking at pornography. (laughs) You will seldom have a Bible and a concordance in your hand when you're tempted to sin. Perhaps you're ready to let your tongue kind of fly off the wall and just completely slaughter someone with your tongue. You will remember Proverbs 12, 18. There is one who speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. The word of God will keep you on the right path. We get into the word. We study the word. We know the word. We learn the word. If you're tempted to do something immoral, your mind goes to 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Flee your morality. Run from immorality, man. 
Like David ran from Potiphar's wife. I don't trust myself. Don't trust yourself, all right? We run from it. We get away from it. The word of God instructs us. It disciples us. It teaches us. And sadly today, we live in a culture and society where people get a a little spoon-fed sermon on Sunday and, and they don't pick up their Bible through the week and they don't really know what the word of God says. Their minds aren't shaped. Their their minds aren't being shaped and molded by the very word of God that has been given to us. And it's so precious. To obey Christ's commandments, we first must have them. Have them. And then B, we see to obey Christ's commandments, we must keep them. We must keep them. John 14, 21, he doesn't just say have his commandments. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me obedience is not a matter of lip service but rather of doing what he commands not just outwardly but from the heart not just doing it to please people not just doing it to get recognition but doing it from the real heart of sincerity towards jesus christ jesus dealt with this in the pharisees in mark 7 6 jesus condemned the pharisees who knew the scriptures well who who knew them and, and they, they, you know what, they, they obeyed, they honored God, but he says that while they look good on the outside, that inside it's dead, inside it's filthy. We also can be guilty of picking and choosing what commands we want to listen to. It's crazy in the church community how we can be so hard against some sin but tolerate our own sin. <laughs> it's amazing how, how maybe we can, you know, I, well, I don't drink, I've never been drug, a drunk, I look down upon that drunkard on the corner, but yet we tolerate our sin of grumbling and complaining. We say, oh, well, I, well you know, I, 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 I can't stand homosexuality. I don't know how anyone would actually choose that sin, but we tolerate our sin of pornography. I'm just saying, we pick and choose what we're for and what we're against. And you know what? It's disgusting. Uh, we, 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 we give, we give uh, judgment to others and grace for ourselves. Judgment to others and grace for ourselves. And so to obey Christ's commandments, we must keep them, not picking and choosing. We listen to his teaching. We follow his teaching. Maybe at this point, you're getting panicky, and maybe you're asking yourself, I try to obey the Lord, but often I fail. Does this mean that I don't love Christ? Could this mean that maybe I'm, I'm not a disciple? Well, I think in this regard, we need to keep in mind that Jesus here is not talking about perfection, but rather direction. Not perfection, but rather direction. I think about in John 17, 6, Jesus prays for his disciples, and he says in John 17, 6, they've kept my word. And when I read that, I'm like, really? Those ragamuffin disciples, they kept his word? I mean, these guys who at the Last Supper were arguing about which of them would be the greatest. I mean, later that night, they'd all desert Jesus. Peter would deny him. Thomas would doubt his resurrection. And yet knowing all this, Jesus says they've kept his word. You know what? I think Jesus saw the direction of the disciples, but he realized they still were a work in progress. Aren't you glad for his grace? (laughs) Sometimes, man, we fail in our perfection. But you know what? He sees the direction. I think about A.W. Pink and and the exposition of the Gospel of John. He writes this, and I quote, Two things are true of every Christian. Deep down in his heart, there's there's an intense, steady longing and yearning to please God to do his will, to walk in full accord with his word. Yet this yearning may be stronger in some than in others. And in each of us, it's stronger at some times than in others. Can anyone identify with that? Nevertheless, it is there. But in the second place, no real Christian fully realizes this desire. Every genuine Christian has to say with the apostle, not as though I'd already attained, either we're already uh, perfect, But I follow after, if that I may lay hold of that for which I am laid hold of by Christ Jesus. We understand, church, and I'm thankful that he's patient with us in our in our sanctification process. So we understand that as 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 he's not talking necessarily about perfection, about about direction. I've already mentioned that 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 to keep Christ's commandments, we need to have them in our hearts. And and in addition, there are four things in our text. There are four things in our text, in the wider context of our text, that I believe. Christ gives us to help us, four things that will help us keep Christ's commandments. I want to I break these down for you. One, responding to Christ's immutable love will help us keep his commandments. Let's talk about this for a moment. Four things that will help us keep Christ's commandments. Responding to Christ's immutable love will help us keep his commandments. 
I've already mentioned the importance of keeping our love for Christ as the driving force. Keeping the love for Christ as our driving force for obedience in this coming year. But behind our love for Christ is his great love for us. We love, why? Because he first loved us. 1 John 4, 19. This is, this is one benefit of partaking in communion as we do regularly here. We're reminded of, of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We're reminded of his shed blood. We're reminded of his broken body. And it's from that love that pushes us to action. As Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says, man, I'm motivated by the love of Jesus Christ. You know, I think about this, and I think this will resonate with you. My family's love for me makes me want to be a better man. You know, when my wife, she's out of town this weekend, when my wife acts up, you know, and is mean to me, I don't want to do nothing kind back to her. It's like, I'm gone, man. I'm going to play golf. All right, I'll be back tomorrow. You're just being a jerk. But when my, when my wife is, 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 uh, is nice to me, she's going to get some of daddy, okay? You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying. You know, she, that love motivates me. That love pushes me. I have four daughters, and my little girls, man, we watched uh, uh, the movie the other day with The Rock in it in our house, and, and they came up to me like, Daddy, you're so much like that. I'm like, are you serious? Like, wow, okay, you know? And, uh, and they just tell me how much they love me and how amazing I am, and I'm the hero, and, and uh, Daddy's the best preacher. Daddy, you're so strong. Daddy, you're the best at softball. Daddy, you're the best at this and, and everything. I got them fooled, man. But you know what I think oftentimes in the quiet moments when they're not around is, man, I want to live up to what they think I am. Their love for me, their great love for me makes me want to become a better man. Their great love for me makes me want to become a better leader. Their great love for me makes me want to love God and be a better model to them. Their great love for me. And, and church, when you think about the great love that Jesus has towards you, let that motivate you. Let that push you. And you think, man, he, he calls me this. He calls me righteous. He calls me pure. He calls me his child. He calls me a citizen of heaven. I mean, that drives me to want to serve him. His love is pushing me. And I think another help that we see in our text to keeping his commandments is number two, realizing Christ's indwelling presence will help us keep his commandments. Let's talk about this. John 14, 23, Jesus answered him, if a man loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. An interesting fact here, verse 23 is the only verse in the New Testament that says that the father indwells us. So what we see in the Bible is all three members of the Trinity take up residence in our heart. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The word used for home in verse 23 is the same word used for home in verse 3 in reference to the dwelling place being made for us in heaven. Until we get to heaven, we got the triune God himself living in us. He's in our home. He's in our home. He's in our temple. This is the temple of the Spirit of God inside of us. He's with us. That's pretty amazing to think about. God is in us. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. We are the temple of God. I think about that, the fact that we're the temple of God, and I, I think about the idea of, you know, sometimes I, I, got a, I got change in my pocket, and when I got a dime in my pocket, if it falls out of my pocket, I don't really care about it. It's a dime. It's a, it's a little penny. I mean, it's worth 10 cents. falls on the floor, I'm, I, I got a dime in my pocket. I'm not really worried if I lose it. I'm not checking if it's there. Sometimes I have a tendency to lose cash. Anyone else like that? That's why I use debit cards. And I got cash. In this pocket, I got $90, all right? I'm a, I'm a baller this week, and my wife's gone. And um, I got 90 bucks. And you know what I do? I, I have this habit. Whenever I got cash in me, I'm always making sure it's still there. I don't like to have cash because I'm always thinking I'm going to lose it, right? And I like it when you lose your cash because I find it, but I don't want no one to find my cash, right? And so, so I make sure this is always there. Why? Because I know what $90 is compared to a... A, a dime. My wife went to the bank the other day and she got out a, a lot of cash and she had something she was doing and, and, uh, and she walked out of the cash like she was carrying a football, man, and walking out real quick looking around. I'm like, babe, you look so suspicious. If I was a bad dude, I'd, I'd target you. She don't carry her purse that way when it's a bunch of pennies in there. What's the difference? She knows what's inside of there. Church, when you realize that God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son is living inside of you, it ought to change the way you walk, the way you smile, where you go, the places you put up with, the things you do with your body. Why? Because your body is the dwelling place of God inside of you. Praise God for that. And I think number three in motivation for obeying 
Christ, obeying God in verse uh, number three, is relying on Christ and dwelling spirit will help us keep his commandments. Relying on his indwelling spirit. It's been said by many that the Holy Spirit of God is the redheaded stepchild of the Trinity. Many people don't want to talk about it. They don't understand it. They don't see it. They don't understand, and I think that's the reason why spiritual gifts in our churches are lacking so much is because we truly don't know what the Spirit of God is. The abundant Christian life is lacking so much. The fruit of the Spirit is lacking so much. But I'll tell you right now, a, a motivation, a help, a help to help us be obedient is understanding that the Spirit of God will help you keep the commandments. The Spirit of God will help you follow Jesus. The Spirit of God will give you the power to follow Jesus. As Galatians chapter 5, 16 through 23 says, I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are in opposition to one to another. So you may not do the things you please. But if you're led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are revealed, which are these adultery, sexual immorality, isn't, isn't all of our society built around sexual immorality? I mean, the Super Bowl, man, you're going to see commercials, you're going to see billboards. I mean, everything is just built around sexual immorality, impurity, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, rage. See, let's not get picky and choosy here. Well, I never struggle with adultery. Yeah, but you struggle with anger. <laughs> Selfishness, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, carousing. And the like, I warn you as I previously warned you, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, this is what the Spirit births in your life. This is what the Spirit of God gives you in your life. It shall be love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness. I want some of that in 2020, right? Faith, meekness, self-control. We need that. I mean, we ate so much over the holidays, we had no self-control, man, right? Against such, there is no law. You know who gives that? The Spirit of God. Wake up every day and say, God, I can't do it. Spirit of God, I need your help. I need your help today, God. I'm going to walk in your Spirit. I'm going to listen to your Spirit. I'm going to tap in to the power of your Spirit. Number four, remembering Christ's incarnate example will help us keep his commandments. In John 14, 31, but I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. Jesus' love for the Father was at the heart of his obedience to the Father's commands. Which in this case refers to the cross of Calvary. The great pain, the great suffering, the great hurt. Any way you cut it, man. The cross was not enjoyable or easy. It was horrific. Not only because of the physical suffering, but also because of the spiritual reality that Jesus bore the Father's wrath against our sin. He did it to show that he loves the Father. He glorified the Father. You know, the real test of obedience is when you don't feel like it. Kids, you want some ice cream? Yeah! Kids, you want to eat your spinach? No. But you know what? When you're obedient, you are better off in the long run when you do it. The real test of obedience is not when you feel like it, but when you know it's right to do. Sin always promises short-term pleasure, but it hides the long-term pain. Obedience may require short-term pain or self-denial, but it yields long-term pleasure. Is it, it is the evidence that we love Jesus. It is the evidence that we love Christ. Loving obedience results in three wonderful benefits, and I want to give you these benefits now. These benefits here, obedience yields three benefits we built the case for obedience. Jesus teaching his disciples about obedience, keeping his commands. We understood and we built the case for what are some helpful things given to us to obey. We're not on our own out here. What are some helpful things given to us to obey? And now what are some benefits in obeying? What are some benefits? First of all, obedience results in the Father and the Son loving us. Let's talk about this, man obedience results in the father and son loving us john 14 21 he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my father and i will love him and will reveal myself to him you're probably thinking 
I thought that God's love is unconditional. Well, I thought God's love is unconditional. But this sounds as if something were earned, or it sounds like it's a merit we try to, try to arrive at. This sounds like it contradicts other parts of the Bible. I already said, as Paul makes it clear in Romans 5, 8, that Christ died for us while we were sinners. His love for us was not based on our love for him. We understand John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. But in our text here, what is the text that we're studying? Jesus is talking about a deeper experience. He's talking not about earning salvation, not about earning his love or being acceptable by the Father, a position we receive in the gospel. He's talking about going deeper. He's understanding he's about to leave his disciples. The next day he's dying. How do they go deeper with Jesus? He's going to be gone, but they can even go deeper. He's not going to be with them, but they can still go deeper. How does it happen? How do they go deeper with him? He's saying to us that as we go deeper, as we obey, the Father and Son reveal themselves more and more to us. Think about Ephesians 3, 17 through 19, as we just read a second ago in our worship time. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. What is, he, what is he writing about there? He's talking about going deeper. Hey, I'm going deeper. Every one of you have met people that prayed a prayer and trusted Christ, but their relationship with God has always stayed stagnant. Now, were they ever saved? I don't know. I'm not the one that judges that. But we've also met people that put faith in Jesus, and it seems like they never stop growing. I don't know about you, man, but I don't want to stop growing. I don't want to be defined by who I was in 2018. I don't want to be defined by who I was in 2015. No, I want 2020 to be fresh, man. I want to read the Bible fresh. I want my prayer time to be fresh. I want to see Jesus fresh. I want to taste him fresh. I want to see a whole new Jesus in 2020. How do I go deeper? Obey. If we have trusted in Christ, he already dwells in our hearts. If you're here today and you put faith in Jesus, the Bible would say he already dwells in your heart. We already know his love, but Paul prays that we will experience his presence and love on a deeper and deeper level. And Jesus is saying that we will get this by obeying him. I'll give you the second thought here. Obedience results, the third, second benefit of obedience. The second benefit of obedience is not only seeing the Father and the Son more, seeing their love more, growing in their love more, but obedience results in Jesus reveal, revealing himself to us. Jesus says that when we obey him, he will disclose himself to us. He will reveal more and more of himself to us. Through his word, through our prayer time, through our study, through the relationship, he will reveal more and more of himself to us. When's the last time you got a fresh dose of Jesus? And when's the last time where man was like, dude, you walked out of your time with God and you're like, dude, man, Jesus is amazing. <laughs> like I saw a whole new side of Jesus today. I mean, when's the last time where, 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 where you, you, you tapped in and you got a fresh taste of who Jesus really is? He's not some distant, stoic, religious figure. He's a very near, active God that came down as man and he died for you and he's crazy about you and he loves you and he represents you in heaven. When you fall, he's defending you to the Father. That's Jesus. And he'll reveal himself to us more and more and more. The Bible calls it, Paul calls it the mysteries of Christ. We see the principle that Jesus states here in our relationship with others. You don't reveal yourself to just anybody. Have you ever gotten a, a life group? Sometimes life groups can be funny because you're like, can I tell them about my sin? Are they going to judge me? <laughs> but some of you got your little friends you got to coffee with, and you just feel like you can open up to them about everything. You can just completely open yourself up to them about everything. And I think what Jesus is saying here is when we obey him, you know what, then he'll feel comfortable and he'll be able to share more and more of himself with us. To share more of himself of who he is with those that are walking in obedience. I think about Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor went to China. 
he was the first missionary to China. And when he went to China, he faced a lot of trouble. And Jesus spoke these words to comfort the disciples in their time of trouble. Has any of you ever faced any trouble in this room? <laughs> Life is full of trouble, man. You're either in trouble <laughs> with your wife. You're either in trouble, you're coming out of trouble, or you're about to go into trouble. Life is full of trouble. And Jesus knew, and let me tell you right now, especially when you decide to serve Jesus. Some of you in this room, man, you've decided to serve Jesus recently, and I'm not going to lie to you up here and tell you that everything's going to be amazing now. Oh, there's no greater joy than knowing Jesus, but you better be ready for the real battle. You got a target, man. And so Jesus is speaking this to comfort his disciples, to deeper, uh, so they can have a deeper revelation of Christ in their souls and have a deeper understanding of Christ. And, and I think about Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor went to China, and, and he face some un unbelievable, overwhelming trials. And if you are looking for some books to read in 2020, add his biography to your list. And he wrote to a fellow worker, a fellow worker that was in the ministry that was going through trials. He writes this uh, in, in The Growth of the Work of God, uh, in the book, The Growth of the Work of God. He writes this and I have it quoted for you on the screen. The one thing we need to know, the one Thing we need is to know God better. Not in ourselves, not in our prospects, not in heaven itself are we to rejoice, but in the Lord. A deeper knowledge and relationship with the Lord. His favorite hymn that he writes about was, Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art, and I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. <laughs> May that be our prayer for this year. Jesus, I'm resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. Are we resting in who Jesus is? Are we discovering more and more of his greatness that he wants to show to us so much? Obedience results in Jesus revealing himself to us. Then I want to give you this next one. Obedience results in enjoying an exclusive relationship with God that the world cannot know. If you are walking in obedience to Jesus, you will know a deeper relationship with God than the world around you has no idea about. They'll look at you and say, man, how do you continue to have the joy? How do you continue to have that smile? I mean, how do you continue? How do you continue? John 14, 22. Notice what Jesus says. Then Judas said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us, but not to the world? He thought about that, Judas, and he thinks about what Jesus was saying, and, and, and he says, how, how is it that the world cannot see you? How is it that the world will not see you? No doubt the, the Messiah, the Jews thought that the Messiah was coming to reveal himself openly, to rule as the political king. But we understand as Jesus had his triumphal entry, they were expecting a king to rule, but they didn't, they didn't understand that Jesus wasn't coming this time to rule or to reign. He was coming to die. And Jesus here, he kind of ignores Judas. He says, the world doesn't really understand who I am. The world doesn't get me. The world doesn't realize that I'm the Savior. The world doesn't really understand me. I'm going to reveal myself to you, but not to the world. And Jesus kind of ignores Judas' question, and he repeats pretty much what he just said in verse 21 and he says he will not reveal himself to the rebellious world, but only to those who obey him. Think about Matthew chapter 13, 10 through 13. The disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? He answered them, it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. They, they don't have an ability to understand what I'm saying. For to him who has will more be given and he will have abundance. But from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because they look, but not to see. They look, but not to see. I wonder how many times we come to church to look, but not to see. How many times do we get in the Bible to look, but not to see? We, we look at the Bible and say, well, I got to check it off my list. I made a goal this year to read my Bible every day. We're, we're, we're looking, but not really to see Jesus. And we go to our prayer closet, because he's our, he's our bunny rabbit foot we run to when things get tough, right? We look, but we don't really want to see him. 
And sadly, that's the case many times. They look, but not to see. They listen, but they do not hear. They're listening to what I'm saying. They're listening to the sermon. They're listening to the teaching, but they are not hearing it. Neither do they understand it. Why? Because, man, they were living in rebellion to Jesus. They were not submitting to Jesus. His final warning in verse 24, he who does not love me does not keep my words. The word which, you're, which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. This underscores this final verse, the enormity of the world's sin to reject Christ. They are not only rejecting him, but they are also rejecting God himself. How could the living God make his home with such rebels? Because Jesus loves rebels. <laughs> Obedient believers enjoy a relationship with God that the world cannot know. So the question for you, church, is this. If you want to grow or know Christ more intimately in this new year, you must figure out right now in your life, what is Jesus calling me to? Now we understand the whole law is wrapped up in two commandments, love God and love people. Now, I think we could, we could use those two commandments to really back up all the other, a lot of other commandments. It is to love God and to love people. But from that, where in your life right now are you not obeying him, that he's calling you to obey him? Maybe you're living selfishly. Maybe you're living self-centered. Maybe you're living all for me. Maybe you're maybe you got some dirty closets right now in your life or where you got a lot of secrets in there and, and you aren't ready to get rid of them and to expose them. Maybe you got some priorities that, that are kind of out of whack. And you know what? God isn't number one. You aren't loving God with all your soul, all your mind. You aren't listening to that commandment. You aren't loving people like God loves people. Maybe you gotta reprioritize. You say it sounds simplistic, but Jesus promises that we will grow to know him more intimately by obeying him. It's not hard, church. How do we go deeper with Jesus? What is he calling you to do right now in your life in obedience to him? Let's pray together. Church, we love you, Lord. We thank you so much for your amazing grace.